people generally tend to think that uh, this uh, negative coverage that India receives is because India it might be a strong competitor to the USA, but it uh, turns out that's not really the case. It's because we can't really be trusted. Is that what can be deduced from this? Yeah, we're not a competitor yet. We're still a semi-colonial hmm. uh, economy, you know, and geopolitically, we're nowhere. You know, we're not even at the level of Iran or Turkey geopolitically or diplomatically. So we're not. We're far from being a competitor to to the U.S. They don't take us seriously as a potential competitor. They see the uh, the Russians as competitors for historical reasons, even though the Russians don't really have the same, uh, you know power projection that they did as the mm -hmm. Soviet Union. And they see China as a competitor. Uh, India is, you know, is not a competitor, but also not a client state, also not a potential client state because it's not seen as reliable. And what's left, rogue state. Rogue state mm -hmm. like Venezuela or like Iran or like Syria, uh, who, you know, you need to discredit constantly in uh, the Western media so that you manufacture consent for regime change mm -hmm. and that regime change or you know even worse balkanization as mm -hmm. was done in yugoslavia yes so then uh one of the best examples of how this works so to combine you know the topics we're talking about both neocolonialism narrative control and uh, you know and uh, balkanization is uh, is yugoslavia so okay. yugoslavia is a country that's you know, close to my interests. I started off my career working with uh, governments there and MPs there as an advisor. And uh, they, you know, were a country that was very close to India uh, diplomatically, but mm -hmm. also in terms of history and culture and uh, let's say political philosophies that mm -hmm. uh, this was a country that uh, had reclaimed sovereignty after the Second World War in a new form. They created mm -hmm. a federalized system, you know, with uh, various federal states. Uh, uh, so Slovenia, Croatia, Serbia, Montenegro, uh, Bosnia Herzegovina, uh, Macedonia, as it was called, uh, and uh, two autonomous regions as well. So Vojvodina and Kosovo. Now, this was a country that was socialist, but not part of the Soviet bloc. It was one of the founding countries of the non-aligned movement like India and Indonesia, uh, Ghana, uh, Egypt. And uh, like India, it played the role of a buffer state that it was not okay. seen as a reliable client state because it was you know, too wacky, too socialist, you know, had too many different uh, ethnicities. And even though there was a strong man leader in Josef Broz Tito, uh, they didn't see it, uh, Yugoslavia as a client state or a potential client state. Okay. Instead, they saw it as a buffer state that, okay, mm -hmm. there's this country which has you know, liberal rights and you know, uh, has a pretty good standard of life and is relatively uh, peaceful, but they're still you know, socialists uh, can't really trust them, but it's better than you know Romania, Bulgaria, uh, mm -hmm. you know Hungary on their borders. So let's work with them. So they mm -hmm. were actually quite well regarded in London and Washington. Uh, so you know the celebrities of the Western world would come on holiday to Tito's island. You know Queen Elizabeth herself would come over, uh, and uh, the country benefited from trade and especially investments from the oh, US. Right. So they welcomed investments, they welcomed loans and aid from the US. And in exchange, they kept their distance from the Soviet Union. And uh, they invested in infrastructure, they became uh, the country with the best standard of living in Eastern Europe. Uh, they had a lot of uh, trappings of success. You know, they had malls and escalators, you know, in the 60s when, you know, <laughs> many countries wow. didn't see those until the 90s or 2000s. Mm -hmm. uh, and then in the 80s, uh, Tito passed away and a new generation of leaders came to power. But most importantly, Yugoslavia stopped being useful to the West as a buffer state when Gorbachev came to power in the Soviet Union and started making friendly noises that, oh, you know, I don't want a Cold War anymore. I'm restructuring domestically, glasnost, perestroika, you know, confidence building measures. And by the end of the 80s, uh, the Cold War was coming to a close. 
uh, and the uh, Soviet bloc was being dismantled and was very happy to uh, become. Do you need a buffer state like Yugoslavia anymore? No. So they, the Americans started saying, okay, now it's time to pay back your loans. So all that aid we gave you, it wasn't for free. There were strings attached, pay it back. At the same time, they started doing subnational diplomacy and they started, they, through the West Germans, uh, told uh, the leadership of uh, so federal states like uh, uh, Croatia and Slovenia that look, you know, uh, you don't have to pay this, you know, you're so industrialized, uh, but uh, Belgrade, you know, builds these factories and spends all the money, you know, from factories and your industrial base in Ljubljana and Zagreb, they waste it on these peasants in, you know, in Bosnia and Macedonia. Uh, don't worry, you don't have to pay. It's the capital that has to pay. It's Belgrade that has to pay. It's Serbia that has to pay. If you declare independence, we'll give you diplomatic uh, recognition. We'll support you, and you know, no, no debts. So, <laughs> of course, you know, with that sort of guarantee, uh, it was wonderful for them to exit the uh, the federal uh, structure and go independent. And the, the roots of the civil war, of the disintegration of Yugoslavia, you know, there's this whole mythology around it. Oh, these incompatible savage Easterners, you know, uh, mm -hmm. these Orthodox Christians and Catholics and Muslims, they just can't get along because it's in their blood. That's nonsense. That's Orientalist garbage. It's, it's racist to say that. Okay. You know, these things don't happen in a vacuum. They happen because, you know, secessionism, separatism is very rarely organic. It happens mm -hmm. because foreign powers give some sort of support. It can be arms and military support. It can be diplomatic support. It can be financial support. That's mm -hmm. how it happens. And this is the sophisticated form of neocolonialism reserved for countries that are too big to be reliable or too diverse to be reliable. So you break them up and then you get seven reliable allies out of it instead of one country that thinks it's a you know, moral authority or a regional power. So that's something that if we're going into a new Cold War between the US and China, India has to remember that we're not going to be accepted as, you know, an American ally, uh, mm -hmm. because allyship means that they'll come to our defense. They will not sacrifice a single of their troops to defend mm -hmm. Indian sovereignty. It's still us who have to do it. And uh, so they're not going to commit to a full allyship. We're going to be a strategic partner, but the risk of being a strategic partner is exactly this, to what happened to, to Yugoslavia, that we act as a buffer state that happens to share a big border with, uh, with the People's Republic of China. And as soon as we stop being useful, as soon as they you know, figure out some peace between them, then uh, you know, they still have all of these techniques on hand. And you can see it now. You can see all sorts of, you know, nascent separatist uh, movements gaining traction, and they live off the oxygen of foreign support. Please remember to subscribe to us and switch on the notifications for this channel. For our other social media links, more content, and to support our work, please visit citti.net. Dhanyavad. Namaskar.